All right. Thanks a lot, Laura. Appreciate it. Appreciate you mentioning the uh, slogan as well. Always great uh, to, to hear that. Uh, well, <laughs> welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm extremely excited about today's webcast. I appreciate all of you uh, joining both all 198, I think, people that registered that will get the recording of this and then the uh, 30 or so people that we have joining us now right now it looks like we're right about 28 and a few other folks coming in so uh, excited to have this conversation and uh, welcoming you to this conversation about how we're going to leverage OS query for compliance. Uh, this is a cool tool that I think has been overlooked from a compliance perspective, you know I, I've overlooked it uh, in the past when I was a, a former auditor. Uh, so today's webcast is a part of a three part series uh, about two weeks ago. We did a series on uh, a webcast on why you need automation and compliance and I, I talked about our, our theory behind it gave some examples from patch management and, and things like that. Uh, and then today we're going to get a little bit more tactical and, and talk specifically about OS query and how compliance professionals can utilize this tool to achieve their compliance goals and reduce management uncertainty when making critical decisions. Uh, so a little bit about myself um, as we get into this. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of ByteCheck. And ByteCheck is a cybersecurity compliance automation startup. And we built a SaaS platform that's designed to automate assessments for startups and small businesses by inter integrating directly with cloud um, like Jira, uh, like AWS Azure GCP, and then other cloud apps like GitHub, Jira, Bitbucket, and more really to automate evidence collection, but ultimately to do what Laura mentioned, make compliance suck less. That's our tagline. And uh, I'm excited to talk with you all about compliance here today, not about bite check specifically, but about how you can just make compliance suck less, whether you're using bite check or not. I sit on a few professional boards. I have a few certifications, including some AWS. I served for six years in the U.S. Army as a signal officer, so any uh, former uh, military folks out there, any vets, thank you for your service. Uh, definitely appreciate all the sacrifices you all have made. Um, stationed here in the States and employed uh, mainly at Fort Bragg here in the States. Uh, and then lastly, as Laura mentioned, I am the SANS Associate Instructor for SEC 557, Continuous Automation for Enterprises and Cloud Compliance. Uh, so uh, enough about me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the SANS curriculum that's available before we get into the, the conversation. So there are a number of SANS courses that we have available here underneath the cloud security pillar. Lots of really cool classes that are relevant to modern cloud environments. And I think part of the challenges with learning about the cloud, learning about cybersecurity, is oftentimes there's a lot of outdated information out there. It's really hard to keep up with the speed at which things are moving. But SANS does a great job. And you can see here on this screen, there's an essentials cloud security course that doesn't just teach you about basic cloud security, but dives into each of the different cloud providers because you, you have to learn about each of those cloud providers to really understand cloud security as a whole. There's a DevSecOps course, cloud forensics, many more. Uh, the course that I teach, Sec 557, up there in the top right, that's up under the cloud security curriculum as well. And encourage you all to check this out. Uh, you know, check and see if your organization is willing to. Uh, allow you to attend one of these or uh, if, you, if any group that you're a part of because the SANS courses are, are truly worth it. All right, so as I mentioned two weeks ago, we went through part one of this series uh, outlining why we need automation to achieve compliance in the cloud. And while we got into a little bit of a demo with PowerShell and in, in that talk, and we talked a lot about the philosophy of of automating compliance and, and Laura's pasting some of those previous articles and series here in the chat. Uh, but today we're going to get a little bit more tactical and talk about one tool, uh, how we can leverage OS query for compliance. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to spend some time talking about a tool that was built off of OS query called Cloud Query. It's talking about how we can do multi cloud, multi account compliance, which I think is really important nowadays because it's very hard to find a company that's not using multi-cloud. Despite how I feel about it, if anybody out there uh, is watching this, you've seen some of my content on different platforms, LinkedIn and Twitter. I don't think multi-cloud is necessary. I think people don't need to do that. And most organizations that think they're multi-cloud aren't really multi-cloud, but we don't have to get into that, uh, my, my little uh, rant there, but we're gonna talk about cloud query in a couple of weeks and I'm excited about that conversation as well. So today we're gonna dive into a 
brief overview of OS query. We're going to discuss what are some of the benefits and basic design principles. For those new to OS query, we're going to take a look at how does this work and how do we apply it to compliance. But the really cool part about today is I'm going to talk for about 20 to 25 minutes here on the slides, and then the rest of the conversation we'll be doing a demo where I'm going to hop into a Windows 10 VM that we have for SEC 557 and an Ubuntu Linux box that we have for SEC 557 as well, where we're going to demonstrate how you can use OS Query on both Windows and Linux, give really a basic overview of, the, of, of how to write some statements and, and do some interesting queries, and then um, also talk about some important compliance tables that I found useful in, in some of my compliance assessments. All right, so let's get into this, right? Uh, what is OS Query? Uh, I'm sure some of you that are listening to this live here now or watching the recording have heard about OS Query. Uh, and it's an open source endpoint package that was developed by Facebook uh, that you would install on your machines as an agent. Uh, and it was developed, I believe, back in 2014. And with OS Query, it allows you to expose system information as a relational database that you can query using SQL statements. Um, so if you have some basic knowledge of SQL, and, and honestly, if you don't, uh, you can really get started using it in minutes. It doesn't take a bunch. You don't have to be a database administrator to use OS Query or to be able to do some functional things on OS Query. Uh, the cool thing about it is it's extensible, uh, which means you can write additional tables. And we're going to talk about these tables that are available. Um, but if there's out of the 275 tables that are out there, if there's one that you don't necessarily see that you 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 could use, you can create your own as well. Um, as of putting this slide together, there were over 200, around 275, I think right at 275 uh, tables where you can get very critical information about your systems. Uh, and just to show you kind of how fast this changes and the power of this being open source, when we first put together uh, Clay Reisenhoover, who is the author of SEC 557, when we first put that course together, there were around 250 tables, and that's early 2021 uh, is when that, that occurred, and now there's 275. So you can see just, just this year that we've added 25 additional tables, and that's how fast this moves, but that's because there's a huge community contributing to uh, OS Query. Uh, and because you OS Query uses SQL, even though there's all these tables, there may be information in one table, you need to combine with information in a different table. Say you're looking for information about users, but you want to find out some more information about the processes that a particular user is using. And you can join tables together using a SQL join statement that we'll talk about here in a little bit. So the thing that had me really excited about OS Query a few years ago uh, was the fact that it's cross-platform, that I could use it on Windows devices, I could use it on Linux, I can use it on Mac OS. Uh, and I can go across all of these different operating systems, as well as different virtualization types like virtual machines or containers or Mac OS workstations or Windows, um, uh, Windows machines or Windows boxes in Azure or containers in GCP, whatever it is. I can use OS Query across these tools. And as a compliance professional, and I, I mean, just as a security professional in general, and I'm sure everyone listening or watching this agrees, it, you're going to be really hard pressed to find a company that has one operating system across the board or one virtualization type across the board. You're going to have some VMs out there. You're going to maybe have some on-prem stuff still. You some serverless stuff maybe out there. You're going to have different cloud providers. You're going to have users, developers are going to want to use their Mac devices and then other folks are going to want to use Windows. So you're always going to have a combined set. So one tool that only works on Windows or only works on Linux, while there's some, there's a lot of scenarios out there where that's necessary, compliance, we should be trying to figure out how do we use something that our administrators can use across the organization to reduce the level of effort on their end, and then also on our end as well from a compliance perspective. So that's the really cool thing that got me just super excited about this is that I realized I could do a lot of powerful things and it's going to save me a ton of time from the compliance perspective, but it's also it's going to save uh, the, the people on the other end of this, the people that I'm asking for this information, them a ton of time as well. So collecting that same information across those platforms and operating systems is, is, is really cool. And I think the open source aspect of OS Query as well is, is pretty awesome. You know, there's a big community behind it. 
You can find a lot of documentation. There's a lot of resources out there. It's traditionally been used, and I know there's a few folks attending that, that, that I talked to on LinkedIn. They said they've used OS query for forensics and incident response, and that's really what you would see generally using this for out there. But uh, that you can still take a lot of the ways that it's been used for incident response, exploring different areas of your operating system and get valuable information from a compliance perspective. Uh, so, and, and one thing you'll know from a from compliance is you're going to see continuous improvement, additional tables added regularly. You can go out on GitHub and search and see a bunch of query packs, which we'll get into specifically for compliance that you can go out and use immediately in your environment, which is really cool. Now, there's just these really quick design principles I want to mention that are important to remember when considering using this in your environment for compliance. So first, it's simple, it's easy to use, deploy and maintain. It's easy to uh, download on your machine or on your OS. You can and you probably should bake it into a golden AMI or some kind of configuration file for new machines if you're doing this at scale. But you can get started right now if you're watching this on a Mac um, and you have Homebrew, you can brew install cast OS query and you're going to get OS query installed on your machine and be able to do some of the commands with me here as long as they're compatible on, on the Mac OS. But very easy to get started and easy to use and deploy and maintain. It's also designed to be performant and reliable. Um, it's not supposed to, supposed to impact any services and it's read only. So your our operators and engineers will know that it's, it's not going to impact anything. There are some nuances there. I don't, you know, I don't want anybody to jump on me. There are some tables that you can't view unless you have elevated privileges, unless you, you know, do like a pseudo OS query I before you run the run this the, the SQL statement. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to do that for most of the tables you may need to explore from a compliance perspective. You should be able to do it with uh, regular permissions and not need to elevate your permissions. But there are some tables out there that do require that. It's easy to integrate. You can do it with multiple virtualizations. We've talked about that. And then lastly, it's flexible. Using that universal language of SQL allows you to interact with data in a, in a really simple manner. Yesterday, I recorded a webinar that's a part of ChefConf 21, which is uh, Chef Software's uh, annual conference. Um, they're doing it virtually this year. So myself and a few gentlemen from Chef and, and with my good friend, Chris Hughes, um, from Acquia uh, uh, software, Acquia company that does cybersecurity, we talked about automation in the cloud. And one of the things we talked about were the challenges of compliance is that compliance professionals, security professionals, engineers all speak a different language. So not using the same language, if you've ever been to a foreign country and you tried to order food and you didn't speak the language, you, you really see how powerful language is and the power of being able to communicate. And I think that's the reason why compliance has gotten such a bad rap and a negative perception is because compliance is not speaking the same language as everyone else. So OS query using this universal language of SQL allows you to interact with this data in a manner that your database administrators understand. A lot of your engineers will understand as well if they, if they have those skill sets. But it's a really good way for you to come to them and say, I know what you're using. Here's a way that we can use it. We, we talked a lot in the last webinar about living off the land and the concept that compliance professionals, auditors, external or internal, need to figure out a way to use these ubiquitous tools and live off the land and use the tools that your administrators are already using and then just let them administer them. This is going to make you a hero at, at an organization if you go to your team and say, instead of grabbing 100 screenshots, I just need you to run this query pack and we're going to schedule it to run regularly so that I get the information that I need and you don't have to worry about it at all. And we're going to just collect that on a regular basis. And if there's issues, obviously, we'll come to you and present it. But it takes away a lot of pain of compliance. And then, you know, the actual that I see in um, you know, I'm going to get uh, shot down maybe by the compliance gods right now, but right now audits aren't that useful. You know, they're not, they're not getting valuable information. When we're getting screenshots, manual pieces of evidence, if you're not using uh, selfishly a tool like ByteCheck, you're getting manual screenshots and evidence that's outdated and it's not technically accurate information. And I think that's a problem. I think compliance assessments should be relied on for determining and helping people make business decisions. 
And one of the ways we can do that is by living off the land, is by sitting here and making sure we're using tools that are producing technically accurate data, not data that's just gonna get you through a compliance assessment, but let's actually find out what's going on and figure out ways that we can fix this. And OS Query is one of many tools out there and one of many ways that we can do this. So a little bit more about how OS Query works. Um, OS Query gets all the benefits of SQL, such as query parsing, optimization, and execution functionality, which under the hood, it uses SQLite. There's a lot of resources out there about SQLite and how it relates and, and how to use it and all that good stuff. And we're not gonna get too deep into that here, but uh, I'll try to add some, some links to that stuff or send it to Laura afterwards so she can send it out to you all uh, with the recording. But uh, there's really two ways that we're going to talk about how you would use OS Query and how you should think about this when you go talk to your uh, team there internal at your organization. Uh, you can do it using OS Query I, which is going to be an a, interpreter that allows you to run ad hoc queries right there on the system. You're going to run them in the console on the command line. They're going to be run locally. Any of the incident responders that are on here probably have used OS Query I in the past to quickly get information about an attack or a potential incident and then be able to go out and do some more additional uh, queries and, and, and diving in. So it runs local queries on the system. We're going to use it today during the demo where we're gonna just hop into OS Query and run this in an ad hoc manner, that same way you would see it used for forensics and threat hunting activities. Um, and then you have OS Query D, uh, which is a daemon or a service, and it allows you to do remote requests against the system. So this is where you can scale this across multiple systems. This is probably what you'll use if you're going to use this from an enterprise perspective. Uh, you're going to be able to take what are called query packs, um, and we're going to talk about that on the next slide, where you can package up a bunch of queries that you find useful to your environment um and run them on a scheduled basis um uh, in, you can run them on multiple machines in parallel which allows you to do very fast and efficient data gathering so that's probably what you'll end up doing in most enterprise environments that's what we see is um people using the, the daemon or the service they bake it into any kind of uh, configuration file or golden ami if you're using aws and, and then that's the way that you can do this at scale, um, create some schedules uh, so that you can get accurate information on a continuous basis. We all know that in most assessments, you're looking out over a period of time, generally around a year. Uh, most of the time, the auditors are going to come in and sample evidence from months or weeks or whatever it is, the frequency that they set. And if you're able to schedule this, these queries that generates this information on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, whatever that frequency is, you now basically have done the auditor's job for them. They don't even have to because you can provide them evidence from the entire review period. And again, we're getting more technically accurate information because we're now able to see directly from the system what was going on back in May, back in January. And we're not guessing, we're not just grabbing screenshots uh, of manual things. So we talked a little bit about this with why OS Query for compliance um, and all about the living off the land and using tools that your administrators are using and letting them administer them. This is so important for compliance professionals to understand, to stop interrupting and disrupting operations. Uh, to make compliance suck less, you have to reduce the time it takes and show the value of compliance checks. And if we just think about what a compliance assessment is, a uh, control that we evaluate is just a risk mitigating activity. And a compliance report should tell management, this is what, uh, how our risk mitigating activity is performing. It shouldn't be about uh, a clean report. It shouldn't be about getting the compliance checks to green. It should be really about how are these risk mitigating activities going? And then what business decisions do I need to make to fix this? Do I need to hire do I need to get a tool? Do I need to do more monitoring? Whatever it is that I need to do so that whatever that risk is on the other end, we treat it in the manner that we want, whether we mitigate it, accept it, transfer it, whatever it may be. But using technically accurate data, living off the land allows businesses and business leaders to make great decisions. Now, query packs are a way that we can incorporate automation into this process. Uh, combining query packs with OS Query Daemon and running these checks on a scheduled basis, packaging up the results in, in whatever format is good for you, 
you're able to make everyone's life easier, including your own, uh, and you're, and you're going to result again in those technically accurate audits. In part one, we talked about the dangers of relying on evidence that only tells a portion of the story um, with patch management is the example we used in part one. Um, and I think this is a common theme across multiple controls and compliance threats where you can produce just enough evidence to pass the audit, just enough to give the auditor just to get you out, but it's not technically accurate and ultimately doesn't result in a more secure organization, which is, I think is what the goals of all of these compliance assessments should be. So using tools like OS Query allows us to gather information directly from the source, automate it so it's done regularly, use a tool that your administrators are probably already using, uh, and makes the compliance process and reports more valuable, both internally and externally. Uh, so it's a really great tool for compliance. Uh, excited to dive in and, and show you all how to, how to use this tool. So um, as I get these virtual machines up, looks like uh, there's no questions so far, which uh, is great. I think I'm sharing the wrong, I'm sharing the Ubuntu box. There we go. So I do want to make sure that the the screen is uh, the the size font here is good enough for everyone. So if someone can give me a shout in the in the chat bot here and let me know if if you all can can see the uh, the terminal here and it, it looks good as far as uh, size or do I need to zoom in a little bit more? Sweet, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. All right, so we're going to hop into the demo and we're going to get familiar and I'm going to turn off my video so that up. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. What about now? All right, there we go. Uh, thank you uh, for, for letting me know that you're seeing that. Perfect. All right. Um, so we're going to look at some useful tables for compliance, but before we dive into those useful tables, uh, I want to just give the basics of, of OS Query so that when we get into the tables, I, I want what happened to me when I first got started using OS Query as my imagination just started going wild. I was super excited because I started to see, oh, wow, I could do this, I could do that. And it just made me want to explore. So uh, we'll go through some basics so you understand how to use this tool. Uh, but I encourage you all to you know go out you know, if you don't have a, a sandbox machine to play on, uh, go create one in, in one of the cloud providers and just play around with OS Query. You're going to have a lot of fun and, and see some cool ways that you could use this tool. Now, I, I turn my camera off just because I want you to focus on the uh, commands here. And then also, you know, I'm probably going to mess up while we're going through this. Uh, so you I don't want you to see my faces as I'm uh, panicking and trying to figure out how I mess things up. But we're going to go for it here. And uh, I mentioned that the cool thing about OS Query is it's uh, cross, you can use it on different operating systems. So I've, I'm have i on a SEC 557 Windows 10 virtual machine that we have for the course, and I have a, a PowerShell session up here for the Windows box, but then I've also switched to our Ubuntu box that we have uh, for, excuse me, for uh, SEC 557. So real quick, I'll just show you that you can see what this uh, box's OS version is. And you see here, it's an Ubuntu box. We can get the version. We can get uh, a few other things here as well, build numbers and, and some valuable information. Um, and then let's hop over to uh, PowerShell and run the same command here. OS version is one of those cross-platform tables that we can use to get information. So this is a Microsoft Windows 10 enterprise. Here's your version and, and all that good stuff. So. Uh, we're going to pop between when this Windows um, machine and the Ubuntu machine, just so that you can see this cross-platform nature of the tool while we're here. So I'm already in the interpreter. You see I've typed OS Query I here, which popped into um, OS Query, and I did the same thing on the Linux box, and I'll pop back over there just because I, I think it's a little cleaner. Uh, but before we get into some statements, let's just look at some key tables that I think you all should be familiar with. So I'm going to do a dot .help here, and we're going to take a look at a few of these. Um, so to exit the program, to leave, you're going to type dot exit, or you can do a dot quit. And if you do that, I'll just go ahead and do it and we'll pop out. Now I'm back on the machine and to get back in, but let me clear the screen. Uh, and then we're going to get back in. There we go. We're back in and now we can get these help commands again. So that's how you leave. Uh, another thing that you can do is run this dot tables. 
which will tell you what tables are available. So if I want to see all the tables that have OS query in it, I run a dot tables and I type OS query, it's going to show me here's all the different, I have an events table, extensions, flags, info packs. So this is a really good way for you to explore what tables are available for you to get some valuable information. Another one is dot mode. So, you know, the hello world of OS query is going to be select star. Whoops, that's select eight. Select star from uptime. And you're going to get it, and you see it's in this nice and clear tabular format, right? You can see clearly what's going on. If I want to change how that looks, I will use this dot mode here. So, dot mode to list. Well, now with that same command is going to give it to me in this format or dot mode to line is what I really wanted to do is going to give it to me on a line by line manner. The default mode is going to be pretty and that's going to be that ta ta table format that's going to do it and really show you that relational database version. So I'm going to change it back to dot mode pretty uh, because it's a little bit easier to read when you start to do some longer, longer queries. So let's just make sure that I did that right and get back to there we go. And you can see I have a history command history by just hitting the up arrow. You can go back and get some of your previous commands, which is which is cool for anyone that's used any kind of a shell. It's it's, it's useful to do that. Um, and then lastly, there's uh, what you're going to see. And then if you if you checked out that article for for this webcast that I put together, you're going to see in there I did a bunch of dot schemas. Dot schema is going to show you how the table was built and the statement that was used to create the table. So say I want to see the user's table and see what are some of the components and columns that I'm going to see in this particular user's table. And you see you're going to see this create table statement. They named it users. And then you're going to see each column. We're going to get an ID that's an integer. We're going to get a group ID. We're going to get a description that's text. We're going to get a username and et cetera. So dot schema gives you some very powerful information that if you're trying to explore what's the information I'm going to get from a particular table and you're trying to figure out how do I uh, get a particular piece of data, you can start to explore some of these tables. And this same information, the schema for each of these um, particular tables is available on the OS query documentation. So you can do it here in the, in the terminal, but you also can do it um, by just looking at uh, the documentation on the OS query site. So we're going to use, and, and OS query is using SQLite, and, and we're going to use mainly uh, select statements, which is, for the most part, all OS query does. There's some additional ones, but we won't get into that. And you're going to see a lot of select statements in this demo. So a few basics before we dive into those specific compliance tables. You're going to see, as you're getting familiar with OS query, and you probably noticed above, that I included this semicolon here. Uh, if you don't do that semicolon and you just keep hitting enter, the, the, the ter interpreter is not going to know that you're done with that command. Once you hit enter, the command will end. So this can be annoying. It's a little frustrating at times uh, when you do this, and you don't realize why. It's because you left off that semicolon. This can be helpful, though, if you're running multi-line queries. So if I want to type the same query on each line, I can do it like that and still get the same result. So if you're copying and pasting some of those query packs that I mentioned from GitHub or some other places, you can do multi-line so that you can actually see and make it a little bit more readable for you to, to get through. All right, so you now know you need to use the semicolon for these multi-line queries. Um, and then we're gonna do a few more queries just to make sure we understand how to get some specific information from tables. And we'll start to dive into a little bit of compliance because when we do some of these initial queries on some of these initial tables, we're gonna do use some of these cross Platform tables. Remember, I talked about there were around 50 tables that are cross platform that allow you to run basically the same query on both Windows and a terminal and a, and a Linux machine, or sometimes on a Mac OS too. We're going to run some of these commands on each of these machines. We've already saw the select star from OS version, which you're seeing here. That gives you the install date, the build number, the code name, and, and all that good stuff that's going to uh, show you that. We, we saw that on both the uh, Linux box and the Windows box. So let's look at another one and select star from users is another one that we can do. The users table is going to be cross-platform and, and something that you can run both on a Windows machine and um, on a Linux box. 
Um, I'm going to limit this, and this is going to be your first kind of introduction, because if I don't, let's just do it if I don't. And you can see there's a lot of text here. Um, it's, a, it's a lot to see. Um, so when we run this over here on the, and let me get out of here so we can get this to the top. There's probably an easier way to do this, but I'm going to do it that way. So select star from users. And if you want to limit the results just to see what some of the get in, you can write this limit clause and then just put a number after it. We'll limit it to three. And now we're only going to get three users. So I can see the root. Uh, I have this user and this user here. You can get some really good information. We already explored the schema for this users table, but it's 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 pretty cool. But what if you wanted to say, you know what, I just want to know how many users are on this system. When I'm thinking about uh, termination, I saw that there was this access request list over here or this list of users, and they said there was only 30 users that could have privileged access. I just want to know how many users are on this machine just to get started. You can do a select count with the asterisk from users, and that's just going to return a integer telling you how many users are on the system. So I can see here there's 36 users on this box. If that doesn't add up to what I expected to see, that's where I can start to explore because that's really what we're looking for. Is there any anomaly from what I expected? So we'll do a select count star from users on this one too. And we're gonna see there's nine users on this Windows box. There was 36 over there on that uh, Linux machine. So that's uh, another good way that you can do. So again, let's, let's do the same thing, a similar function for the group table. The group table is another cross-platform table where we can get all of the groups, and you can see the information that we're going to um, get there. Uh, let's see how many groups we have on this particular machine. I don't think they're going to like that space, so I'll do that. Oh, wrong table. That's how you all know this is live um, when I continue to mess. So we have 61 groups on this machine. Let's ask the same question over here on this machine. 19 groups over here on Windows. So again, just some really good information that you can get from both machines. And if you put this together in a query pack, you can go out and say, hey, run this on all your Windows boxes, run this on all your Windows machines, um, send it back to me and I'll have everything that I need. Another table that's really important from a compliance perspective that is cross-platform that we all will care about because I, I really don't know uh, any security framework that doesn't require you to understand which ports are exposed and open. So we can get this information from the listening ports table. And I'm going to limit this to 10 just to make sure so we have clean results. But you can see we're getting some good information here. And let's let's just do a dot schema on the listening ports table so we can see we're getting process IDs, we're getting ports, we're getting protocols. Um, the address, some some really cool information here that we can find out um, and 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 really dive into. Okay, what's what's going on here um, with 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 these different um, uh, listening ports, and and then start to do some additional information. So same thing on this Ubuntu box to show again the cross-platform nature of this. We'll limit it to five here, um, and again, same information, same table that you can get both on Linux and on Windows that I'm sure is going to be useful. Um, now, what if you see this and you're like, okay, this is a really weird way to organize this, AJ. Um, it looks like um, they're ordering this uh, with, with no real functionality here, no real thought process. And I want to order all these results by the port. I want to make sure that we know it's by the port. So what we can do is we can use the order by statement to say, where do we want the list to be um, ordered by how do you want how we want this sorted so i'll say order by port and now the results because it starts at it's starting at zero are going to go in order though all the way down um, and we're going to be able to get the result and we can do this for any one of these columns up here which is really powerful um, you saw that i put the order by here um, it has to go in front of the limit or it's not going to work um, and one of the other cool things that we can do is say we want to get the interpreter to filter by, it doesn't just have to be an integer, you can do it with the username too. Um, so I'm just going to say, give me all that information from users, and then I want to order by username. Let's limit the results to 10. And now this is going to go in order too. So you can do both text and 
you can do uh, integers as well. So this is where we're starting to see the power of using SQL to get this information. I hope the creativity and kind of the, the, the light bulbs are, are, are going off right now where you're able to see, oh, wow, I could probably get a lot of the information that I normally get in another manner. I can get it using some of these cool tables. Um, and being able to filter, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a core tenet of, of SQL is being able to look for like specific pieces of data, right? Um, and being able to do some of these filters. So let's go back to that listening ports example. Let's say I wanna get the process ID, the port, the address from the listening ports table, but I only wanna see where the port is port 22. I want to see wherever where are we where are we oh and I, I maybe don't even need to do a limit on this one. Um, where do we allow people to access this machine over port 22? Um, so you can see here that this is really this machine is open to the world, um, and we're allowing anyone from any address to to access this machine over port 22. Which probably if this is a class VM, so that's fine. But if you saw that in a production environment, you you'd probably want to dive into that. And let's do the same thing over here on this one where port on the windows box equals 22 which really shouldn't see but you see some of the same information here um, where we're getting that so that's where you can really get into i want to see some specific information maybe you have a rule in place that you shouldn't only allow access from your vpn over certain ports you can run queries to check that on a regular basis and then you know do some information with that later on or provide it to your auditors um, in, assess in, a, in an assessment. But what if you don't, you know, right there, we knew the exact port that we wanted, right? We knew exactly we wanted to go get information from port 22. What if you don't know the exact piece of information that you want? So we're gonna say, give me the UID, the GID, the username, the description from the users table, but I wanna know, I just want to know where the username has system in it. So I'm going to run this and it looks like we got messed up here. So let's close this out and we're going to run this on multiple lines. So we're going to see the multiple lines so that everyone can see this username description. Whoops. And then we're going to get that from the users table. And then we're going to do this where clause where the username is we're going to use like and like is really just so that you can search anything i want to see where the username includes system and then the preferred wild card in sql is going to be that percent sign so you're going to want to throw that percent sign to say anywhere any username that has system in it give me that data um let me end that and now i'm going to see here on this windows box i only have one machine let's run the same thing over here or one user um, on this on this machine just to show you again the cross-platform nature from users we're going to do where whoops oh, i gotta get username that's good username like give me all of the system usernames here and on the linux box we should get a few more than one there we go um, we get the time sync one and the um, network one and a few other users there that are on this box so this is really cool um, stuff here with sql and i know this isn't supposed to be a sql one-on-one -on -one class but i think it's important as you mess with os query to see and start to put together how you can get specific pieces of data from um, from the uh, from the system, and that's a good question, uh, Michael. There in the in the chat. So uh, I don't know. Generally, uh, I don't think things are case sensitive, but let's give it a shot here. This is the the beauty of a live demo. We'll we'll try it out. Um, doesn't look like it. Uh, looks like you can do either way. So uh, pretty cool there that you, you can search for really anything using that wildcard. It's not going to be case sensitive. Great question. So one last thing that we want to talk about are going to be joins, which this is going to be the thing that you're probably going to do the most. Um, and there's 275 tables like we talked about. Um, so you're not going to necessarily get all of the data you want from one table. There's probably going to be some tables that you need to get information from um, one table, one the information, and then another table has some other information that you may need. Um, so I'm going to give you an example here. Uh, you want to see which user is running a specific process. So let's look at the processes table. Uh, and we can see we're going to get a bunch of information, but I'll, I'll save you the time of searching. There's no username in this table. 
uh, you're not going to be able to get that username. You can, though, get this UID of who's running that particular process. Um, but we can see if we go check out the users table, there's also the UID here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a join. Um, we're going to join our information from the processes table with information from the users table. And this is where you're going to do some cool things in compliance. If you think about that listening ports table and seeing which processes are using some of these open ports, you can really dive into some really, really detailed and good information. Uh, so real quick, I'm just going to show you. And, and again, this isn't supposed to be a SQL course, so you're going to have to kind of learn on the fly if this is your first time seeing this. But I'll try to make it uh, understandable for everyone, regardless of your experience with SQL. And I'll try to do some caps in here so you can see where the clauses are and, and not get a little and that we'll make this easier we'll make this a multi-line query so that it's really easy to see so from the processes table which we're going to alias to p we're going to join the users table which we're aliasing to you on the u.uid which we saw it there at both tables, the processes table and the users table both have a UID field in there. So what this is saying here and what you're going to see in, in this uh, statement, the interpreter is going to read the whole statement first and then go back through and do things. So sometimes there's going to be stuff later on in the statement that impacts something earlier on the statement. So right here, when I say select p.pid, what I'm saying is select from the processes table, select the PID. And the reason that P equals processes is because after I wrote processes here, I aliased it to P. And really, this is just so that you're not writing a really long statement if you're doing these joins. So you don't have to write select processes.pid, processes.name, users.uid. And if you're doing a really big join statement and getting a bunch of information, you want to try to shorten that down and make it as readable as possible. Uh, if any of you uh, are, are Python coders out there, um, you know, you, you want to make your stuff readable and usable and kind of have that mentality of simplicity. And you should do the same thing here. And this is a way that you could do it. So you will alias and I'm seeing I'm doing the same thing on this users, users alias is to you. So all I'm doing is saying, give me the process ID from the processes table. Give me the process name from the processes table. Give me the user ID from the users table. Give me the username from the users table. Um, and then I'm saying from this table, I'm going to join it with this table. And we're going to join it where the user ID and the process and, and the user where the user ID is the same in both of these. Um, so let me limit this to five just in case. And here we can see we have information from the processes table in the first two columns and information from the users table in the second two columns, which are really cool way as you're thinking about how do I want to get information out of these compliance tables, these joins are going to be the best thing for you. Um, one other join example that we can do really quickly here and I see your comment here about uh, what you would recommend, what I would recommend for SQL courses for beginners that are that are less technical. I think get started with OS Query. Honestly, uh, it may be overwhelming at first, but when you really just learn the basics of the select statements here in OS Query, it's going to give you some of the basics of SQL that you then can go out. Um, I, I oftentimes I'm using uh, I forgot what the I think it's w3schools.com. Uh, There's um, uh, like a free online resources with a bunch of documentation. Uh, and then I'm sure SANS, um, and I, I'm sure Laura's probably looking, but I'm sure SANS has like a SQL 101 cheat sheet. We create a lot of cheat sheets to help people learn um, some, some, some good skills that you could use. But the best way that I learn is hands-on. Uh, honestly, it's it's getting your hands dirty, poking around. OS Query is a great way for you to do that locally on whatever machine you're running right there. You can install it and, and start poking around and run some basic queries. Take a look at that article that I put together. Uh, Rewatch this to see some of the basics and, and you'll get comfortable the more you poke around. All right, um, so the let's let's just take a look at um, <laughs> Absolutely, Laura, I, I can do that. Um, I, I'm signing myself up for more work there. Um, so I'm gonna do one more join. Um, I'm trying to get a 
uh, I, I'm, I, we've already looked at the listening ports um, where report 22 is open. So let's combine that with the processes table so that we can get some more information. So I'm gonna go get the process's name. I'm gonna get the state of the process because that would be important here. I wanna find out the user ID. And then from the listening ports table, I'm just gonna get the port from that table because there's one specific port I'm looking for. Um, and then let's make sure I don't have any typos because I wrote this command before and I've had some typos that cause issues. Um, and we're gonna join it with the listening ports table that we're gonna alias to LP. Um, and I wanna join it on the p .p the p PID, which is the process ID from the from the processes table um, with the processes process ID from the listening port table where the port equals 22. Um, and why didn't it give me that information? Um, remember I told you that there's gonna be some information that you can't get unless you're running in an elevated shell. So um, let me see if uh, that's why. So if I do sudo OS query I, and then um, I should be able to get, P. sorry, I'll have to type this out again. I wanted to show you all that um, elevated privileges being needed. Um, so I may have intentionally done that, which will be cool. From process P, join listening ports LP alias. And I want to do it on the process ID and the listening ports. Uh, where did I have an error? All right, we'll skip this because I, I cannot figure out where I have that error. So I don't want to get um, uh, messed up uh, there. The asterisk, where did I put an asterisk? Oh, why am I doing select? Yeah, you're right. Like star, you're right. Good call. Thank you. And this is why you do live. This is why people, um, this is why I like the community in cybersecurity because um, you mess up and people will help you and not judge you. And even if you are judging, it's okay, but I appreciate the help. Um, thank you, everyone. So we'll do this and we'll hopefully get the results we're looking for to see which processes are using this open port. Man, again, what am I doing? <laughs> oh wow all right all right all right all right all right all right we're gonna figure it out this time gotta slow down from let me get that join let me get this there we go we did it all right so this is another way that you can join a table together. Um, and I'm going to have to zoom through some of these tables because of that, that mistake there. But appreciate the community there for helping me out. Uh, really helpful and um, uh, glad glad you guys are here to, to, to help me as I'm making some mistakes typing there. So a few compliance tables that we can get some cool information. Uh, one is going to be this uh, programs table where you can get information that you may want to uh, find out for CIS critical security control too, um, where you can find out the software versions and make sure that there's are approved versions um, there. So I'm going to limit this to one so you can just see what the table will show you. Um, you're going to get the name, the install date, the version. Um, one note um, here, and uh, I don't think it's viewable here, but you're going to get the install date in uh, epoch uh, format. So your epoch times, so you need to convert it to a human readable format, and you can do that. PowerShell or a number of other uh, programming languages out there. But if you're doing that CIS critical security control too, and you have to see if there's only approved versions installed, this is a great way to do this. In SEC 557, we use PowerShell heavy and we run a um, uh, get, get service or get, pro, get service on the Win32 product command in PowerShell, and it doesn't return Firefox on this machine. Um, but when you run that here, you get Firefox there. And that's just because of limitation with PowerShell, where if you installed it in a weird way, which we installed it using Chocolatey, uh, you will get, you won't get some of the information back from PowerShell. But with OS query, you do get that information. So really nice little information to know that you might be able to get more information out of OS query 
instead of uh, uh, instead of some of the other tools that you may be using. Another very uh, valuable uh, <clears throat> valuable table is going to be the patches table. Um, and this is going to return the same data that you would see from the git hotfix um, command um, if you're running PowerShell, but you're going to find out some valuable info that's going to tell you when's the last time the system was patched. Maybe you need to see if a specific hotfix ID was um, uh, deployed on this pat or patched on the system. Maybe there was a critical uh, CVE that came out that you need to check for. You're going to be able to get that information here from this patches table. So very useful. I um, mean, again, same information that we covered in part one, where we did the git hotfix command on PowerShell. It's going to give you the same information here, uh, but you'll be able to get it here through OS query and maybe package it up with uh, the uh, query packs. We also going to have the services table, which is going to provide you all of the services running on the system. Uh, it's roughly equivalent to that git service commandlet, and and that's really messy. So let me limit that to one, so you can see this and. I, I do explain these in a little bit more detail in the in the um, blog that supplements this, but these are tables that you probably are going to want to get some good information from. Uh, and there's also the Windows event log table, um, and I'll just do a dot schema on that table before we hop over to Linux. Windows event log. Uh, so you can see some of the information here. The key to know about the Windows event log table is that you're going to have to include a where clause that specifies an event ID. And that's mainly because it's just too much data to return the result without a specific where clause of saying what event you want. So you would do this where clause and include an event ID. There's a bunch of event IDs about creating new users, elevated stuff, and all this other stuff that you do. But the Windows event log is a great way to find some really important information about anything that just happened. Now, you may be limited by any retention policies that an organization has there. So if you know, you're only going to be able to get four days of data or something because of some retention automatic um, deletion or whatever policies, you might want to check into that. But the Windows event log table, another really valuable table from a compliance perspective that I've, I've used often. All right, let's briefly go through some really important Linux tables. So we're going to get some information from about the kernel um, that's going to give you information about the version um, on the system and, and some really valuable information that you may want just to make sure that uh, you're using the right versions, approved versions, again, thinking about the uh, uh, critical security control too. Um, you also can get information about the kernel modules, which there's a lot of security standards out there that are going to um, I list all of the, the kernel modules that exist on the system, uh, give you some really valuable information here. I should have did a limit on this one, um, and I will just so that we can explore the top of the table. Where you can get uh, a lot of the information, specifically the status and, and, and things like that. So really cool information. Another table that I think all of anyone that's a compliance professional here will, will want to explore is going to be this SSH configs table. Um, where you're going to be able to see some good information about uh, are we allowing root, are we allowing passwords, um, and, and check out these configurations. Now, this table, uh, I think, used to be a Linux only, but I looked at the OS query docs recently, and it does show that you can run this on, uh, it looks like it's on, in the cross-platform now, uh, so you can probably run this on other machines as well uh, to get, and then the, this table here is going to show any information about executables with the uh, SUID or SGID or the privilege escalation bit set. So if you're looking at least privilege type of stuff, this is going to tell you um, if you're violated any least privilege principles. So another valuable table here on the Linux side that you're going to want to get some information from. And then lastly here on the a table that I think we'll care about as well as going to be the disk encryption table. Um, we're going to be able to see, and let's just limit this to one again so we can see valuable information that's included here, the name and the encryption status. So, you know, encrypting your, uh, your, your, your machines at rest is really important on, I think, every compliance ask you to, to look into that uh, from a compliance perspective. So another table where instead of asking for screenshots, instead of asking for manual pieces of evidence, you can collect this on a recurring basis that allows you to make your life easier and your uh, your uh, team's life easier as well, just by using this tool. There's a 
bunch more tables, like a lot more tables that I would love to explore, but I clearly can't because I'm already here um, uh, at the buzzer, but I'll try to answer. It looks like we have two questions here, but I would definitely encourage you if you're you're watching this to uh, do some hands on explore OS query, um, see if you can get some experience using the tool, because the best way to learn is hands on uh, best way to learn is to poke around and you can install it on any of your machines. Um, so first question here is around file integrity monitoring and OS query. Uh, that's really the power of OS query that a lot of incident responders and forensic folks use it for. The file table is where you would do that. The file table is actually like the um, Windows event log table where you have to specify the path. So you would have to specify exactly where that path is um, to that file for you to do some checks. But uh, I would look into Uptix, um, U-P-T-Y-C-S. They have a lot of good resources and content for OS query. They have a free online OS query training that dives into forensics on file integrity monitoring and shows you some examples. You get a free virtual machine to poke around with. So I, I would, I think that's the one of the best resources I've seen. Um, I've never really worked on the incident response side or the uh, defender side there to do file integrity monitoring, but I that getting that hands-on experience um, through that demo that they do and, and the VM was really helpful for me. And then I had another question here, it's how can the ability to query individual systems be leveraged at scale? So if we go back to uh, the um, this, this slide here around OS query D and using the daemon, you can do remote requests and run this as a service. You can schedule the queries to run across the enterprise. And that's the way you can do this at scale. Uh, obviously doing those manual checks are not gonna, going to be uh, useful from an automation perspective. So you wanna kind of scale that out and in a manner that uh, uh, is gonna allow you to kind of automate it and set it and forget. So using the name and using the service and installing it there on your machine is how you can do that. Cool, it looks like that's all the questions, Laura. So I uh, definitely appreciate the time. I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thanks everyone that joined. Um, I hope to see you all in a couple of weeks when we do the same thing about query. And, uh, and, and also, you know, reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns. I'm pretty reachable on Twitter and LinkedIn to, to hear your thoughts. Um, see that we have one last question on how to install. Depends on the machine that you're in, but if you have homebrew, uh, brew install cask os query is how you would be able to install that just on your terminal or you can just go to the os query documents page you how to install it on whatever distribution you have whether windows uh linux or or whatever you're using out there terrific thank you aj uh everybody should mark their calendars for august 24th for the part three of this series it's the final part in the series a copy of the slides and the recording will be available in your SANS portal account in about 24 hours. And you can also find your CEUs for this webcast and any other completed SANS webcast by signing into your portal account, navigating to your account dashboard and clicking my webcast, and then you can down your, download your CEUs. We look forward to seeing you on the 24th and definitely reach out to AJ, connect with him on Twitter and LinkedIn, and we will see you soon. Thank you.